the Trump campaign used these false claims of election fraud to raise hundreds of millions of dollars from supporters who were told their donations were for the legal fight in the courts. But the Trump campaign didn't use the money for that. The big lie was also a big ripoff. January 6th committee member and our next guest, Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren, who played the leading role in the panel's second hearing, that's what that was from back in June, focused on the disgraced ex-president who knew he lost and still used the big lie to rip off his own supporters, tricking small dollar donors to fund his inner circle and the rally that preceded the campaign attack. Now, Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger tells NBC News that the committee is digging deeper into those post-election fundraising lies, signaling that it could be one of the, quote, missing pieces the committee focuses on when they come back in September. Joining us now, California Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren. Congresswoman, I, I wondered when, when this story sort of exploded, um, if that benefited the, the committee to sort of be, be out of the limelight for a little bit to do more of your investigative work before returning to, to public hearings in the fall. Well, we've been busy all summer. Um, certainly the staff, as well as the members of the committee meeting, we meet often virtually, um, and we're working away to get ready uh, for our full report, as well as uh, some hearings or a hearing in September. Um, there's a lot of information. And, uh, you know, we're on the second half, obviously, of the investigation, but we're still finding new things. The Secret Service incident was was one of the, um, I won't say, uh, well, was. It was one of the most dramatic revelations that the committee shared with the public in both Cassidy Hutchinson's public hearing and, and subsequent hearings. And, and Congressman Kinzinger signaled that there's more information and evidence that's been developed. Can you talk about the importance and whether Mr. Ornato's resignation from the Secret Service makes him a more cooperative witness? Well, I have no idea. Um, but uh, we do have a lot of concerns about the Secret Service. Uh, there, uh, you know, there were a lot of things that seem like uh, pretty weird coincidences. They were told to preserve all of the records. Uh, Eleven days later, they erased all the records. Um, we were trying to get information in a collaborative way uh, for almost a year, and it wasn't until we subpoenaed them that, that really an avalanche of new information started to come in. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of concerns about the Secret Service. I don't want to disparage uh, many fine employees of the department um, who risk their lives defending uh, people and chasing bad guys, uh, but there is a concern about some aspects of the services uh, behavior, and we need to uncover it. With Donald Trump's obstruction of the criminal investigation uh, that that is at the core of the Mar-a-Lago search, the question of his obstructive conduct vis-a-vis -vis investigations that touch him or threaten him is, is very much on everyone's mind. The patterns are familiar, and your committee has already shared some evidence with the public of witness tampering. I wonder if that conduct is ongoing on the part of the ex-president and his allies. Well, it's something that we're very alert to. I think we have publicly mentioned the concern that um, the uh, Trump world has paid for lawyers for some of the witnesses and the possibility for coercive uh, action in that case. So that's something that is of great interest to the committee. And we are, I think, learning some more things about that that we will at the proper time reveal. Has there been any more or deeper um, sharing of your transcripts with DOJ? There's an ongoing uh, discussion, as you know. Um, DOJ is, you know, different than the legislative committee. <laughs> they don't share anything with us, and, and they shouldn't. That's not a proper role for them. And we have our own legislative uh, lane that we're working on, but we're certainly not in a hostile uh, condition with DOJ. Can you characterize the, the volume of requests that you're getting from DOJ? Are they ongoing? No, no, I really can't. Um, and I do think that uh, it's pretty obvious from what we've seen in the news that they have their own active investigation 
And uh, actually, they have a much greater opportunity to compel testimony than the legislative committee does. And we see that they are doing that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's clear from the redacted affidavit that they have um, active high level uh, witnesses that are that are cooperating with them. I, I want to ask you about evidence that that may have made it not seem shocking, but it is shocking. The, the committee presented such a compelling and horrific portrait of Donald Trump's enthusiasm for the weapons carried by his own supporters on the ellipse on the day of the insurrection and his enthusiasm and devotion to being with them as they stormed the Capitol and carried out violence described as more brutal than combat and medieval by the law enforcement officials defending the Capitol. When you hear or when you see his lawyers threaten unrest and you hear his closest ally in the U.S. Senate, Lindsey Graham, warn of riots. What is sort of your, your base level concern about the all the talk and all the normalizing on the American right of political violence? Was well, it a great concern? We saw before uh, January 6th, the ex-president stoking grievance really with lies and stirring up his supporters to the point where violence occurred on January 6th. He's stoking grievance again among his supporters and allowing uh, some of his stand-ins, such as Senator Graham, to float the idea of violence. I don't think it's responsible to do that. We've seen that um, people uh, who are uh, maybe not as well-balanced as we would hope act on some of these suggestions. We've already seen some threats to law enforcement. And I think President Biden is right. Uh, all of us who are elected leaders, and that includes Republicans, need to stand up and say, this is not acceptable. Violence is not an appropriate political tool and counter that. And I, I'm still waiting uh, for my friends across the aisle with the exception of Adam Kinzinger and, and Liz Cheney, I'm not hearing any Republicans say that. They need to. Liz Cheney tweeted out the picture of all of the, uh, not all, but some of the classified material that was seized in the search of Mar-a-Lago and talked about more indefensible conduct from Donald Trump. Um, to your point, it's been defended. Um, most Republicans didn't find it indefensible at all. They're, they're, they're deflecting and attacking on all fronts. At least three government agencies have had to harden security, the IRS, um, the FBI, um, and the National Archives just in the last um, 10 days. What is the circuit breaker for this climate? Is it holding Donald Trump accountable? Well, I think we need to hold Republicans uh, in the House and Senate accountable. You know, um, Jim Jordan, who if Republicans were to take the majority, would chair the House Judiciary Committee, uh, tweeted out something uh, basically saying the FBI found a, a Time magazine cover. Well, I mean, that's absurd. Uh, you could see the pictures of the secret and top secret material that had been apparently intermixed with magazine covers and the like. Uh, that that I, I just it's inexplicable how this could be defended. You know, when, when you have human intelligence, you've got uh, people who, if they are discovered, can get killed. People who are providing information to help the United States in our national security. Every one of us, from right to left, ought to be defending. Uh, those individuals are trying to help our country, not exposing them to potential elimination by our national adversaries. So I, I really do think people in this country uh, need to demand leaders in both parties to step up to the bat and condemn this violence. And that's what it's going to take. You and Congresswoman Cheney, I think, have taken the lead on um, working on reforms to the Electoral Count Act. Is that something, in your view, that needs to be passed um, before November? Yes. Well, I don't know if it has to be before November. It, it should be this year. As a matter of fact, Liz and I are going to be having a further discussion this afternoon. We're almost at the end uh, point, and I think we've got a pretty good work product, and we'll be collaborating with our Senate partners to see if we can meld different versions and have the best 
possible reform effort. And I think it will be important. I mean, uh, John Easton himself indicated that his plan violated the Electoral Count Act. It violated the 12th Amendment. So it wasn't in any way legal. But the, the way the act is written, it allows people who want to violate it uh, to have a better opportunity to violate the law. And we can tighten that up, and we should. Uh, are you um, in any position to help those of us who look forward to covering more public hearings plan for when in September they may take place? Well, I always leave those announcements to the chair and vice chair, so I have to disappoint you today. But we should be ready. We should be prepared to stay late and, and watch more public hearings in early September. Well, we have we hope, as, we, as the chair has announced, we will have at least one uh, public hearing in September. My guess is, this isn't a formal announcement, that it's going to be very tough to get the entire report done uh, by the end of October. But we'll have some key findings. And uh, it's just, I mean, there's such a volume of information uh, to be displayed and and. Uh, conveyed and hopefully in a way that's accessible to the American public. So we're working hard on that this summer as well.